Uh, well, good morning, y'all. How incredible it is. That was a video we took last year at our grand opening. And how about giving yourself a round of applause for this morning getting to be here on the very first uh, first birthday that we get to celebrate as a young new church. Uh, how incredible that we're all making history here in this moment. Just as a year ago, those of us who were here at that grand opening, we got to celebrate, make history, and here we are again getting to make history um, all together as a church. It's amazing that it's a year. How, how incredible it is that, that 365 days, here we are later, and it, it's, it's just unfathomable to, to really sit back and look at the story of our church and how it's all come together here in this morning. Uh, it's amazing to think that uh, about two years ago, my wife and I, Aaron and I, we, we kind of sat down and started dreaming, right? We had no idea that this new church would be called the Corner Church or what it would look like or that we'd be here at the middle school. We didn't know any of the details, but we just had this dream in our heart, right, to start a church. I remember we met with a couple of the very first families, like Joey and Tasha Dennis and, and all of their army of kids, right? And Stan and Christine Davis and your two boys at the time, right? We, we all met together um, at, at uh, Old Santicanal Park in November of 2017, and it was freezing cold. Like, whose idea? Oh, it was my idea. Terrible idea. It was freezing cold. I told you that we would one day laugh about it, so now two years later, we finally get to laugh about it. But it's amazing that we just dreamed, and from the couple of us that grew, we went from a Bible study in our home to meeting in the, the, uh, the conference room here, the, the hotel that we have here in Monk's Corner, then moving over to Old TNT Canal Park to rent the museum for services. And so we grew from just a couple people to 20 people to 30 people, and then we started having our preview services where many of you were a part of those. And we, we had our preview services, and this time a year ago we had our grand opening, and we grew from, from 20 to 30 to 50 to 70 to 80, and now we're on the, uh, on the edge of knocking on the door of 100 people every weekend, which is incredible. It's been amazing to celebrate how dozens and do dozens of people, many of, that, that's you, that's all of us together, many of us have, have had kind of our, our hearts reawakened right, to Jesus. We've seen many of our brothers and sisters give their lives to Christ. We've seen 10 people this last year show their commitment to Christ by being baptized, which is amazing. Amen, church? It's incredible. It's amazing. We've, we've been a church, although we're small and brand new in our first year, we've, we've dedicated hundreds of hours to loving this city around us through Christmas festivals, through different outreaches, right? We've, we've spent hours at the nursing home loving on some of our older citizens. We've spent hours at the Cal and Lacey home, the group foster home we have here in Monk's Corner, loving on kids. We've spent hours at the women's uh, rehab center that we have here in our community, loving on people. We, we spent hours doing miniature block parties at several neighborhoods that were typically a little overlooked. Man, we've been a church that is really here to love our city. I remember a year, a little less than a year ago for our very first Christmas, right? Last December, we had this crazy goal. There were only about 45 of us at the time, but we wanted to give $1,000 to bless the custodians here at the middle school. We wanted to bless their team because they do such an amazing job. I know many of us who are parents, right? It's already a, a headache trying to clean the bathroom after one or two teenagers. Could you imagine after, after 2,000 teenagers cleaning up after them? And so we gave only 45 people at the time. We gave $1,000 to bless the custodians. Isn't that incredible that we did this last Christmas? And just a couple weeks ago, we felt it heavy on our hearts to be a church uh, that helped aid the relief in the Bahamas after the hurricane. And so with the group of us, we raised $500 that we gave to help that relief. And it's amazing. I love this church. I love it. I have all the different churches that I've uh, been assistant pastors at, I've been staff pastors at. I, I love this now more than, more than ever. It's amazing how we've loved each other as a church, right? Where, where some of us were feeling a little beat down, so we prayed for each other, we lay hands on each other, we, we lift each other up, we've, we've helped each other financially in, in hard times. Man, we are a loving church. I love this family. And listen, if you are on the hunt for a church family, this is a place to be a part. This is a community, not a place. This is a, this is a people. This is a community to be a part of, really. We're all different. We have our own quirks, but I love that we get to be together every weekend. I remember um, Aaron, Aaron and I are not originally from Monk's Corner. Um, in January 2017, we, we moved into a house right here in the community, and, um, and we, we stayed there. And I remember just as we were on the beginning steps, right, of praying about this church, we were praying for God to lead us 
praying for, what he would kind of move in our hearts of what he'd want to see this church manifest into. And, and we just were praying together. And I remember just this, this, this sensation that so many people here in our city have this feeling in their hearts and their souls of being washed up. Do you know what I mean when I say that? That feeling of washed up. About a month ago, we took our little boy, Mason. We have a little two-year-old boy. Well, he'll be two next month in October, and he is crazy. He is wide open all the time. And we took him to uh, Saltlands Island, went to the beach, and, uh, which is one of our favorite places to go in all of Charleston. Went to the beach, get some sun. Ooh, it was amazing. And we showed up at the beach, right? And, and there's this little spot like, to go to. There's like hardly anybody is ever there, usually wherever we go. And so it was just us and like a few other people. And we were out there having a fun, uh, just like, a fun time, really enjoying ourselves. And I remember the, w- the, the wind was just terrible. Like it was so hard. Have you ever been to the beach, right, where the wind is just hitting you so hard but pushing you over? And the waves were ginormous as they were just crashing over themselves. It was beautiful at the same time. And I remember Mace and I, we were just walking through the water, and a wave would come and crash into him, and he, he'd push him right over, right? And he's very independent, so he likes to stand up on his own. So he'd get up, and, and if you walk, another wave would come and crash him over, right? And, and I promise you, I'm a great dad. I love my son, but it was super funny to watch all this happen. And and so if you're a mom, you're like, oh, oh, I can't believe he'd let that do that. They're like, dads, you understand me right now, right? It's a little bit funny, okay? A little bit funny to see your kid get crushed by a wave over and over and over again. But doesn't life sometimes feel like it's one wave after another pushing us down? Like one challenge, one hardship, one, one problem, one after, like this domino effect, right? We don't know how it starts or where it comes from, but we, we feel this, Right? I feel like being washed up on the beach, kind of senseless, don't know where we're going, and just exhausted from all the waves that have been pushing us over. Perhaps you're young and you're in school right now, and, and, and perhaps maybe you, you've been praying and really been hungry to, to see God bring some great friends into your life. And so you're maybe in high school or college or even middle school, and, and there are people all around you, but you feel alone. And so you've been praying and praying and praying for God to bring you friends, but yet you still feel so alone. Like there are people you're acquaintance with, acquaintance with who you smile and wave, but there's nobody who you'd really spend time with, who you'd have that enriching friendship with. And so maybe in your life you've been praying and praying and praying, you just feel beaten down by this, and at the same time as you're praying, asking for God to do this, he, he's not answering us, so we kind of find ourselves in a spot, or oh, asking God, where are you? Like we, we, we ask, like, where did, how did I get here? How did I get to myself in this circumstance? We have all these questions about these problems. At the same time as we're asking them, it doesn't matter if we, we see ourselves as a believer or not. We've all been asking, God, where are you in these moments? God, don't you care about me right now in this season or in this moment of life? This guy I'm dating, he just stops texting. And, it, and I thought he was the right one. I thought he was the one that we were going to get married. But turns out he likes somebody different. So we get crushed in that moment. But sometimes it's bigger than a moment. Sometimes it's even a season. It's a season of, of praying and asking God, God, what's next in my life? What's that next chapter? What's that next step? And, and we don't hear anything. So we get so angry. Or perhaps there's even some hurt in the past where we've been abused. And so we say, God, I hear that you love me, but why didn't you stop this? Why is this pain ever more real inside of me than it it has been before? Why is it holding on to me like a leech and it won't let go? God, don't you care? Have you been there? Or perhaps out of the blue, You've got married, life is wonderful. You got the kids coming, everything's perfect. Then all of a sudden she leaves or he leaves. And you're like, how did we get here? Why? Or we have this dream of wanting to conquer our debt, right? We want to win financially. And we have this this big motivation, right? I'm going to stop using my credit cards. I'm going to stop doing this. But then all of a sudden the, the transmission goes out. I've been there. And I don't have three thousand dollars, so we gotta get back into debt for that, or or there's something that breaks in the house, and so we gotta we gotta go back into debt. As it feels like we we start to gain some momentum, but then we feel pushed back down by another wave. Have you been there in that moment? Perhaps when 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 you go to the doctor's office and you hear that you have an illness, right? And 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 you get a treatment plan and you're excited, and you believe it's gonna work, but you're praying for it to work, but it's not. And you're like, God, where are you? 
Why aren't you showing up? Or perhaps it's someone in your life who you love, whether it's one of your kids or your, your, your spouse or, or your, one of your brothers or sisters or even a parent, right, who gets that, that diagnosis from the doctor and you are crushed saying, God, why would you let this happen to them? Where are you? Have you been there? Because I, I have. When I was young, one of my favorite, one of my best childhood friends, I'm sure many of us have these childhood best friends. But when I was young, one of my childhood best friends, his name was Jonathan. And we were, no joke, we were dumber and dumber. Like, we were dumb and dumber. Like, that's who we were. Is we, we'd go out and do things. We would constantly get into trouble with each other. We would always do things that would cause havoc on our parents. And we would always get hurt in some way. That, that was our friendship. And when I was in the sixth grade, and my parents sat me down and shared with me and my brothers that they were getting divorced. Man, Jonathan was my best friend through all that. He was strong for me. And he'd cheer me up. He'd encourage me in every, every single possible way. He was my childhood best friend. And I remember when I, I went to high school, and we both went to separate schools, lived in different cities. And so we kind of lost connection a little bit, but we still kept in touch and whatnot. And, and it had been about a year since we last saw or talked to each other. And I remember one afternoon I came home from school. I, I would have been in maybe the 10th grade this time, maybe 16 years old. And I drove home in the driveway. And I, I went up into my room. I remember my dad came in and he sat down. Something he never did, never done before. He sat down. He looked right at me. He says, Andre, I don't know how to share this with you. But I just heard from Jonathan's mom that he has cancer. And we were 16. That that shouldn't happen to a 16-year-old, right? And so I remember in there in in my room, sure, I had been going to church for a little bit, but I was like, God, where are you? Why aren't you here? Why are you letting this happen to him? And I remember I was broken in that moment, saying, God, why would you allow this to happen? So I've been there. Friends, I understand maybe it's a little bit odd as we come into this moment, come into today, and we're talking about these hard things because today is about celebration, right? Today is about, woo! right? Get the cake, the mall, get the cake, right? Today is exciting. It's fun. But friends, I've really been, been just convicted with this as we need to lean in and, and, and press into this and talk about it this morning because it doesn't matter if you've grown up in church and, and went away. It doesn't matter if your grandparents brought you when you were in middle school or high school or younger. It doesn't matter if you've never been to church. It doesn't matter if you, if you say, yeah, I kind of believe in God, but not really right now. He's not my focus, right? He's just kind of there in the background. It doesn't matter if you say, no, man, God isn't real. He's got nothing to do with me. Man, if he was real, he's just way far away. He has nothing to do in my life right now. It doesn't matter where you are. We have found ourselves in this moment of asking God, what is going on? Being completely pressed down and, and, and squeezed out of everything we have, all the hope and the joy that we possibly could hold on to is taken away from us. We found ourselves in this moment before or even this season, and we've been there. And more than ever before, I want us to be leaning into this because God is so good. This series that we're starting today, y'all, this series, Hope in the Dark, is this magnificent conversation that we're going to be having the next couple of weeks about how do we know that God is good when life isn't? How do we find his peace, his hope, his joy when we keep on getting pushed under the waves? How we find it. And it's so important for us right now. It's so, listen, it's so important because I really am convinced more than ever before, many of us have been asking these questions of God, where are you? I've been trying to be a good person. I've been trying to do the right thing. I've been trying to go to church or I've been trying not to do bad things anymore. I'm trying not to party or hang out with those friends. I'm trying just to be a good person. And yet we still feel this. We still feel washed up. And so in the midst of our celebration today, listen, after our service, after this time together, we're going to go get some cake, we're going to get t-shirts, we're going to jump on the ca- jump castle. And if you're 12 or young girl, okay, so sorry if you're a little bit older. But we've got to lean into this, can we, church? Amen? We've got to be leaning into this. When we're looking at this guy's story, 
And, and his story is a, a little overlooked and when we look at the grand scheme of the Bible. You see, the Bible, of course, you might know this, but it's broken up into two different parts with the Old Testament and the New Testament. And, and in the Old Testament, there, there are kind of these two major uh, portions. There's the story, there's the history side of it from Genesis to Job. And, and, and so we read a lot of story, this chronological stuff. Not all of it is perfectly uh, one after another, but that's kind of the miss of the first half of the Old Testament. And in the second part from Psalms and to, to Proverbs, we have some of our poetry, right? And we love we love the poetry part of, of, of Scripture. But then from that moment on, from Isaiah, Jeremiah, and to the end, to Malachi, we see these books of the Bible. They're called prophetic letters, and which kind of sounds archaic. Maybe you grew up hearing this, or maybe it's, to you it's something completely brand new. But, but these books were written by people who had these burdens on their heart, who, who were spokespeople for God. God would speak a message to them and say, hey, listen, I want you to bring this to the people, right? They're turning their backs on me. They're running away from me. Would you share this warning? Would you let them know that I love them and I don't want them to run away from me? And all the time he would have these prophets, these spokespeople for his, but there's one one person out of all of them who's different. All of them, it's the same sequence of a message from God to a person and to a people. But there's one person where it's actually in reverse. Where it's a message from the people to a person, to God. This guy's name is Habakkuk. Did you hear me? Habakkuk. I'm counting three. Say Habakkuk with me, all right? One, two, three. Habakkuk. Right? It sounds like we're coughing up something. I know. It's a crazy name. But in his book, it's only a couple chapters long. And he's saying the same things. Oh, we are God. Where are you? He's saying the same things to God. Now, let's, let's dive in and, and read it together. We're going to be in chapter one, and we're going to read just a handful of verses together. And, and, and I encourage you, we have some Bibles on the seats. I believe it's on, on page 442, or maybe it's 449, but, but somewhere in that general area, that's where Habakkuk is. And it's also going to be here on the screen as well. But we're going to read a handful of verses. I want us to lean in and just sit with, with hearts that are like drip pans, ready to catch whatever it is that God is speaking to us. Amen, church? Amen. I love it. Listen, we are a, we are a family. We talk. We have fun together. But listen, verse 2, are you ready for this? How long, Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Or cry out to you, violence, but you do not save? Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflicted abounds. Therefore, the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous, so that justice is perverted. My friends, in this moment, Habakkuk, he lived about 600 years before Jesus. And so literally 2,600 years ago, Habakkuk, this is before Christ, this is before, um, but before the church was established. Any of that, listen, listen, God uh, hears this man calling out to him saying, God, where are you? We've been asking for help, but you're nowhere. Listen, God, we've been asking for a favor. We've been asking for your blessing. We've been asking for your guidance, but we don't hear anything. God, where are you? We've been asking for your healing, asking for your hand, your favor. We've been asking for you and your presence, but you're gone. 2,600 years ago, he was crying out the same thing that we are today, saying, God, where are you? Where are you? You see, what finds ourselves in this moment is 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 perhaps we, we get this excitement to begin doing something new. You see, what brings us to this moment, very similar to Habakkuk right there in that situation, is that we have this climbing effect in, in our life where we feel like we're gaining momentum, right? Maybe it's just getting married or making a new friend or dating somebody new or, or starting a new career or getting a new car or whatever it could be. Listen, or all the kids are out of the house. Woo! Whatever, right? Whatever the situation could be, we enter into a new season of life and we feel like we're on this mountain peak kind of moment. But then, then we feel the waves come and we feel like we get turned up on the side of our head and, and we start going downhill and we start to, and we start to wonder, God, where are you? Why is everything turning upside down? Why is this happening, God? 
we were ambitious and excited before. We were like the karate kid, right, to take on the world, right? Listen, if, if you don't understand the reference, we've got to be watching that movie together. The Karate Kid, it's amazing if you're high school or younger, possibly haven't seen the movie, but it's phenomenal how he, he like learns, right, to, to, you know, to wax on and wax off and to, to sand the floor, right, sand the floor and to, to paint the fence and paint the house and to, to do all those things, right? And then finally he discovers what the purpose of them are and he learns why he's been taught all those things and he gets excited and he starts winning these matches. He's going, watch out, yeah, take it on the world. He's unstoppable. But then you know the story, sweep the leg and he gets brought down. So we find ourselves climbing in life and we get our legs taken out from underneath of us and things just start going downhill. Now that new car, the batteries didn't, it won't start. Or on the way to work, it gets a flat tire or the transmission goes out or, or that person we're dating, again, they, they leave. They're not the right one or they betray us in some way. Or that kid who is so sweet, that baby of ours who is so adorable, who's perfect in every way, now slams the door in our face and yells at us, what happened? find ourselves in this moment where life is going down and, and what happens is is begin to experience what's called a, a crisis and especially in our relationship with God it's called the crisis of our faith where we start to kind of have our hands in the air and say God what is going on listen I don't understand I thought this is where you would lead me but I don't hear you anymore God what is going on we experience this crisis in our faith and what's so uh, what we, we've really got to understand what's so important and we've got to lean into and recognize is we, t- we tend to do one of two things when we're in this moment. The first thing that we do a lot is we pretend. We pretend that everything's fine. We're praying, but God's not doing anything. Right? We want to keep that smile, so we pretend when we're around our friends or we pretend when we're around our people in our church or we pretend just in life itself. We try to pretend and ignore it, right? To push it to the side and say, it's not real. It doesn't have any hold on me, but we try to ignore it. We say, oh, there's, there's no issues in my marriage. I'm just going to kind of ignore it. Or, oh, God, he, you know, I'm not really angry with him. I'm not going to yell at him. So we try to ignore it. We pretend. But the problem isn't solved. And the second thing that we sometimes tend to do is we just kind of say, God, listen, you've clearly left, so am I. I'm out. And we say, I'm done. And so whether it's in our relationship with God or in life itself and other relationships or any kind of season, when we find ourselves between a rock and a hard place, we just either pretend or we say, God, I'm done. It used to be that midlife crises would happen in our 50s, but now to, nowadays it's been happening to people in their 40s and people in their 30s even. Men, more than ever before, finding themselves in their 30s and this crisis kind of moment, they, they pretend. We, we tend to pretend. We, we tend to pretend. That's a play on the words. But we tend to just kind of ignore the issue. We try to pretend like life is okay. We tend to pretend like we're living the glory days again. Like we were in high school or college, like we were single, so we're out with our friends all the time, completely neglecting our families. But what we don't realize is inevitably, if we just pretend, it's going to lead us to the outcome of number two, of just saying, I'm done. And for a long time, when we find ourselves in a crisis moment in our faith and life, We've been walking in those two different things, but we don't realize that God is trying to open up our eyes to see a third option that we've got to lean into, we've got to grab a hold of, is so important. But in a moment, when we talk about it, we're not going to like it. We're not going to like it. But we've got to wrestle with this this morning and just press into what God is wanting to speak to us. Amen, church? Amen. You see, after Habakkuk is finished, there in verse 4, he continues to talk. And, or I'm sorry, he, he finishes talking, but then God actually answers him back. Can we read verse 5? Look at the nations. This is God talking. Look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed. For I'm going to do something in your day that you would not believe, that you would believe even if you were told. I mean, it's amazing. If we, just, if we stop there, it's like, wow, 
God is about to do something incredible. He's about to do something amazing. Our imagination gets going, and we're like, God, what are you going to do? We get excited saying, yes, God, I'm hopeful. Yes, God, I'm ready. I'm ready to see you move. I'm ready to see you. You step in. But in this moment, as God is talking to Habakkuk, he says, oh, hang on, I'm not finished talking. And he goes into verse 6. I am raising up the Babylonians, which are the bad guys. I'm raising up the Babylonians that are ruthless and impetuous people who sweep across the whole earth to seize dwellings not their own. And God continues to talk, and he gives this response to Habakkuk that, that we don't like. He says, listen, I want to do something great. I want to do something awesome. But he says, but what you feel like is bad now is just the beginning. It's going to get even worse. And, and we don't like that. I mean, especially could you imagine here in this moment as he hears that, he's like, it's going to get worse than this. You're going to let the bad guys win. You're going to let them, you know, uh, push me down. You're going to let them defeat me. I don't get this, God. And we, we don't like this answer of just wait. Just wait and see what I will do. And sometimes it's that idea of waiting that we really don't like because we want to know right now what is our exit. We want to know right now how we get out of this feeling, right? We want to know right now how we, we get out of this hardship, how we get out of this challenge, whether it's a moment or a season, we want to find the exit now. But that God calls us to wait. Because many of us possibly, you know what happens next in the story of history is that after Habakkuk has already died, this is way after his life, but then God brings freedom to those who are captured. He shows them tremendous favor, even when they're, they're slaves, they're, they're, they're captives to the enemy, the bad guy, the Babylonians. And God shows them tremendous favor. It's remarkable. But yet we've got to wait. They've got to wait. And friends, although this is hard, we've got to be leaning into this truth and this reality to wait on God and allow ourselves to wrestle in our waiting. It's so important because so often we become just silent in our waiting, but it's okay for us to wrestle. What's, what's interesting is that Habakkuk's name, his name actually means to embrace and to wrestle. And so within his story, God is inviting him to embrace the hardship, to wait and wrestle through it. And to know that good stuff is coming to wait on God, which, which he doesn't like, but that is what God is inviting us to. He doesn't promise that he's going to save the day, be the, the hero who brings the bandit and saves it there in that moment. No, God has this bigger picture of our life and the story that we're writing in our lives. And so although we get bogged down in our teenage years or in our 20 years saying, God, why am I not successful? God, why am I not moving forward like these other people? We get so, this, this kind of telescope kind of vision of seeing this moment that God is saying, wait, just wait and see what I'll do. We don't like this. It doesn't, it doesn't match our understanding of who God is. Because especially if we've grown up in church, we've built this concept that God is somebody when we're, when we're good when we behave well, when we do the right things, when we, you know, don't go to parties, we don't drink, we don't cuss, we don't do any of those bad things, we don't have sex before we're married, we do all those things, then we can kind of cash in all of our good deeds and say, God, can I have some of your blessing? We kind of cash in and say, God, can I have, have some of your favor? Here's a, here's a prayer request that I really, really want. We have this transactional concept of who God is, and that's not who he is at all. We don't like it. But it's the truth. That's not who our amazing, infinite, mighty, holy God is. And we've come up with these, these sayings that, that all things happen for a reason, which is not what Scripture tells us. We've, we've, we've kind of been walking in this, this circle, these habits of saying these phrases that help us get through hardship. But when they're meant to comfort us, they really turn out to be just pillowcases full of rocks that hurt us. That God won't give us more than we can handle. That's, that's not true. That's not what it says. Or that all things happen for a reason. No, sometimes things happen because we make mistakes. And God didn't want that for us, but it's what happens. 
God doesn't make hardship happen. He didn't bring that abuser into your life. He didn't make that miscarriage happen. He didn't take away your loved one. And we've got to lean into that reality and to wait and to trust and to hope and to hold on to God. Because although sometimes he doesn't necessarily calm the storms and push those hardships out of our life, he certainly is wanting to sustain us through them. And that's what he's speaking to Habakkuk in this morning. I understand this is hard, especially if you're in a really hard season right now. This is hard. This is not some quick ointment just to, to heal us in this moment will be perfect. And this is something, this is a truth that we've got to be wrestling with and to realize that sometimes we have to wait, wait and wait and wait and to trust and to allow God to do whatever he feels is best. I remember when I heard the news about Jonathan. When I was crying in that moment, I... I quickly called him up and told him that I heard the news. And I tried to find out a time I could come over and see him. And I remember I raced over to his house. And I remember I knocked on the door and I was trying to hold everything back. Those questions, God, why would you let this happen? Why would you bring this hurt into his life? He's a great person. I remember I knocked on the door and he answers it and and it had been about a year since we'd last seen each other, but it felt like we were kids again. And we hugged and we cried. It was so great to see each other. And we went into his living room. We sat down. We talked. We caught up. Right? We talked about what activities or sports we were doing. We talked about what girls we were dating. Right? We were 16-year-old guys, okay? I just started dating this girl named Erin. She's beautiful. Maybe she's the one. I don't know. But we sat there and we talked. We caught up in his living room. And completely out of the blue, he looks at me and says, Andre, have you, been, have you been going to church at all lately? And I was like, yeah, actually, you know, recently my parent, my mom, thought it'd be good for me to go to church. And so she recently been forcing me to go because as a 15, 16-year-old guy, I did not want to go to church. I didn't grow up in church at all. Don't know why I'd want to go to church, but my mom forced me into it. It's like, yeah, I actually just recently started going to church. And, and as soon as I said that, this giant smile grew across his face that was as long as the couch that he was sitting on. And I remember we were talking there in that moment, and he just takes over the conversation and goes, listen, I too have just recently been going to church. I too just recently gave my heart to Christ, been following Jesus. And I tell you now, the only reason I have this joy in my body is because of Jesus. And I remember hearing those words, thinking to myself, What? Like, are you crazy? I mean, just months before this moment, my, my grandmother had passed away from cancer. And in that moment, I'm looking, I'm like, Jonathan, you're going to die. Like, don't you realize? I'm not saying any of this out loud, but I'm thinking it. I'm like, how can you say that you are hopeful? Are you crazy? It's not going to get better. But he continued to talk. He continued to talk about how he'd been loving Jesus and been feeling his presence even more in his life than ever before, how he'd been feeling his strength and his encouragement ever before. And I was like, what? And sadly, I, I wish this could be a moment where God steps in and says, listen, it's going to get better. It's going to become great. Listen, listen, this is, it may be dark now, but listen, it's going to be awesome. I wish it was that verse five kind of moment of saying, just wait, see what I'm going to do. Watch, you're going to be amazed. I'm going to heal you on the last second. That's not what happens. I remember a few months later, I came home from school that same moment with my dad sitting on my bed. He says, Andre, I don't know how to tell this to you, but Jonathan died. And I was like, it's not fair. He was a great kid. We're 16. This is not supposed to happen right now in our life. God, why would you do this? So I remember a few days later, his funeral was planned. And I went to this church that he was a part of, and, 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 and the auditorium was filled with a thousand plus people from his high school who just loved him. He was such a good kid. He loved everybody, he made a huge impact with his life. And I remember sitting there in the funeral, just a few rows from the front, right in the middle, and, and I was asking those questions, God, why would you let this happen? All of those things. There came a, a moment in the service where 
people were able to get up and share some stories. And I remember Jonathan's younger brother got up and shared. He would have been only 11 at the time. And he was very short, and he came up to the microphone, and they had to drop it down for him. And in front of a thousand plus people, this 11-year-old spoke in the mic. He said, listen, God did not kill my brother. Jonathan loved Jesus to his very last breath. And although he died, it is because of Jesus we got to be with him longer than we were supposed to. And because Jonathan never stopped loving Jesus, I won't either. And I sat in my seat and I was, what is going on? Like, I don't get this. And I started to be asking these questions inside of me, and I was saying, God, listen, I've been going to church. I've been a nice person, but I don't have that. Whatever that is, I don't have it in my life, and I want it. I'm tired of pretending. And I definitely don't want to just walk out and say, I'm peace, I'm done. No, I'm tired of pretending. I want what's real. I want that, that true that sustaining love of God that pushes us forward. And listen, God is inviting us to wait. And although sometimes the outcome may not be what we want, He's inviting us to wait. He's inviting us to press in and push forward. And Jonathan would share, even though he died at 16 years old, just before his 17th birthday, he told me over and over again how he felt so close to God. Although he was about to die, his heart was full. His soul was filled because of his love for Jesus. Listen, God is inviting us to wait. We don't like that, but we need to wait. But regardless, we need to press through, move forward. Because although Jonathan's body was crippling and being destroyed by, by cancer, and although his body was never healed, his soul was. And although on the outside his life was at the very bottom, his heart and soul were at the top of the mountain. Friends, we need, when we're in these moments when life is hard, and I understand this is a hard conversation. This is not easy. It's not an easy pill to swallow. Listen, I understand this is hard, which is why we've got to be like Habakkuk and wrestle with this. We've got to embrace our story. We've got to press forward and lean in and above all love Jesus with all that we are. We've got to be leaning in and pressing forward. We're we waiting on God. Friends, in this moment, I want us to do business with our Savior. Can we, can we each close our eyes for a moment? I want us as individuals, although we're in this corporate setting as a church family together, I want us to do business with our amazing God. And as your eyes are closed, I want to read this over you. Please soak it up and allow it to go deep into your soul. Perhaps this may be familiar to you. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. Would you just take a deep breath in this moment and let it go? He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. Friends, with your eyes closed, ask yourself this. Is Jesus the shepherd of your life? Is he all that you need? Is he your identity? Is he your, feel, your feeling? Listen, wrestle with this in this moment. 
And perhaps if you're in a position where you want to make a, a course change, you want to change the trajectory of, of where you're walking right now in this moment, and you want to embrace God, listen, this moment, listen, this moment, tell Jesus that you give him your life. Tell him in this moment that, Jesus, I'm sorry for walking my own ways for so long. In this moment, I give myself to you. Jesus, I want to follow you. Say that to him in this moment. Listen, if you're wanting to embrace that real, raw relationship with him, speak that in your heart and your soul in this moment. Say that to Jesus. Grab a hold of this moment and embrace it. Grab a hold of his love and his hope and bury it deep inside of you. Listen, if you're saying this right now to God, would you raise your hand? No one is looking. All eyes are closed. Would you raise your, your hand? I want to celebrate. Yes, amazing. If this, in this moment, if you're saying, Jesus, I'm following you, listen, raise your hand. I want to celebrate with you. Yes, God is awesome. Listen, embrace him. Say, Jesus, you can have all of me. Father, thank you for this moment. God, in this moment, we are completely and utterly yours. Lord, although we are in the darkest moment or in the darkest season, God, we are yours and we know that you're walking with us. Our hearts, our souls, our lives, and our actions belong to you, oh God. We love you. We pray this in your holy and powerful name. Amen. Amen. Friends, I, I love you too.